All right, so I'm going to talk about rumen cannula or rumen fistulas. Uh, I've been doing research for a couple of years now here uh, at our university. Uh, I can't really say the lab. Um, so I'll just get right into it. So that's what it is. If you don't know, here's, here it is as well. I'll throw this around. So you can pass one. Yeah. Okay. Great. Why don't you point to it with that laser pointer and get practice yeah. with that? So there's the rumen cannula or fistula. And that's just like a little cap that sits there. So in order to get access to the rumen, you just kind of punch it through. And as long as you got a glove on, because that thing reeks, uh, you can pretty much do whatever. So the reasons to do it are for uh, nutritional purposes, mostly with uh, dairy. I know Kevin's going to talk about something with uh, beef, but usually dairy. Uh, so you keep the cows for longer, because you have to kind of slaughter the beef ones. Um, we have some that are going into their fourth or fifth lactation even, which is pretty crazy. And uh, that's something that I just researched, uh, transphenation. So it's actually taking microbes from one uh, one lactating cow and putting it in another. So rumen development's huge. And that's thing. what that term means. I think that's a new term for me. That'd be good on a crossword puzzle. Yeah. yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's really helpful for rumen development and uh, feed efficiency, which is mostly the research. So the surgical procedure, uh, it's pretty crazy. I didn't actually get to see one yet in person, so I watched about like five videos of it. Uh, so you start with restricting feed for 24 hours and water for 12, and that's just because cows don't really know. They just pack so much into their rumen, like it's, it's full. You can't even put your hand in sometimes. Uh, and you do an antibiotic dosage 20 minutes prior to the first incision. And so you scrub, you, you shave it down, it's the left paralumbar fossa. Say that loud, louder and slower. The left paralumbar fossa? Fossa. F-O-S-S-A. -S -S and here's the thing to remember. It's always on the left side. The rumen mm -hmm. tends to be on the left side of the abdominal cavity. And maybe sometimes we can talk about a trocar and bloat. If you have a cow, cow and bloat, you put the trocar in the left paralumbar fossa. To, and you have to do this in emergency cases. And then so left, para, P-A-R-A, -A, means beside, and lumbar, lumbar is really the waist of the cow in a sense. And fossa, F-O-S-S-A, -S -S -A, always means a depression. It could be a depression in a bone, but in this case it's a depression in the body. So if you ever look at a cow, the depression in, in the hook right there? Right there. Yep. Left paralumbar fossa. So you administer 2% lidocaine, 15, 15 cc's to three of the vertebrae in the lumbar. So one, two, and four. I don't know why they skip over three. The guy really didn't talk about it. Uh, but so you can start with either like drawing a uh, four inch, that's four inch cannula there. You can get three and five. Five is pretty iffy. But usually you start with three and they grow and they stretch into a four. Uh, so you make the, the uh, circular incision or you draw it on. I actually watched a guy get a compass and he just put a scalpel, a scalpel on it and then just wow. made the incision from there. Uh, so you tear into them and then... Well, no, cut into them. <laughs> yeah, you cut into them. And then you kind of... It's kind of like really iffy on this part because it doesn't matter how much you clean them because as soon as you make that oh, yeah. uh, vertical incision into the room and the entire surgical area is Contaminate. compromised at that point, yeah. Okay, so before you go on, I don't know if you realize this, but the cow is standing, and this is just local anesthetic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no general anesthetic. The animal is not laying down or anything. It's like you put the animal in a chute, you put the head gate on her, and you do it. And a lot of times the uh, anesthetic is injected into an inverted L format. I'm not sure that you just talked about up in the... Uh, lumbar region, mm -hmm. you know, that's probably another way, but the nerves, the sensory nerves come off not at a straight uh, angle yeah. off the bone, they come, they come off the uh, vertebra and then they angle back like that. And what you're doing is just numbing those nerves so they're not transmitting pain to the brain. Yeah. So the next slide is kind of, uh, I mean, if you guys are, you should be okay with it. But so that's what the rumen looks like pulled out. So from there, you kind of take towel clamps and then you just clamp it to the outside of the skin. You make your incision and then you peel it back so that... I even have a towel clamp here. Look at that. Yeah. Amazing. So you peel it back so that there's no, uh, no exposed area. So the, this part around it, it's kind of gone. The skin's kind of folded over. So that way you don't risk getting liquid into the cavity. 
a lot of people actually leave this entire section of the cow, so they'll make the incision all the way around, but leave this area so that any rumen fluid that does spill over will actually flow out instead of into the cavity between <coughs> the rumen and the, uh, the skin. So from there, you, you towel clamp around it, and that's when you actually just chuck the, uh, the cannula in. So you chuck it. Please. You leave it, you, you keep it in warm water so that way you can, you can move it around because it, it, they're very tough. And uh, we actually had some problems with it before that I had to, had to deal with, but I'll talk about that at the end. So you, you throw it in there and uh, then you do some stay sutures and you're pretty much all clean. So the post-surgery is pretty, pretty basic, there isn't really much to it. Uh, everybody kind of does a fly spray because that disgusting smell and everything's going to attract a lot of flies and you want to do some rinses because that is an open wound and they are kind of just laying in their own filth all day. And then you want to rotate the cannula so that way the, the skin doesn't kind of fuse to it. So you just move it around every once in a while. So you prevent adhesions. Yep. You and I work as a good team, do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> I've got all the medical, the, 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 the medical knowledge. I take what you say and then, you know, put it into... Professionalize it. Yeah, exactly. So here's some references and that YouTube video at the bottom is actually really helpful. Uh, one to watch. I know you guys aren't going to actually do it. Uh, but he does the whole surgical procedure. It's really interesting. Um, but yeah, that's it. Are there okay, any so we're ready for questions or comments. The one comment I make is, okay, they can do this in sheep. They basically could do it in any room and they would go into the same place, okay? Um, and sometimes if you go by these cows, there'll be a little, uh, I hate to say slobber, but there'll be some, sometimes some rumen fluid flowing down or evidence of some leakage and you can't really prevent after, that. After the procedure? Yeah, after the procedure, like two months later, you'll see some rumen fluid because you know it's not a tight oh, yeah. fit. And then uh, you know it's not bad, but you made a good point. You don't want that rumen fluid going outside the rumen but inside the abdominal cavity because what condition then will you set up if you got rumen fluid leaking and touching the intestines on the outside? Down, down intestines. No, I mean, what's the general condition when there's an inflammation of the abdominal cavity. Peritonitis. That's what you set up, is peritonitis. Okay, but now we have, okay, back there, go ahead. Does it affect production in any way? Uh, okay, so uh, the production values only for the first like week will, will drop, mainly because you're restricting their feed and their water. But other than that, because you're doing it right, uh, right at dry off, like right after dry off, it doesn't, their production values really don't matter anyways. Okay, so you're saying, and you know, some people don't know what dry off is, that means if you do it right after that, then you've got at least 60 days where they're not milking. Yes. <clears throat> but then they're going to go into milk again. Well, yeah, they're, they're going to calf. They're going to have roughly yeah. 66 yeah. days of dry off. They're 60 they're days calf. until parturition, basically. Yeah, exactly. And then why don't you tell us about the swine, and, and you know, something so similar in swine. Oh, um, so for pigs you can do the same thing, although it's not um, as much, it's not really a microbial work, it's more about um, nutrient value, so a lot of times it's for phosphorus because that's one of the most expensive feed additives. Um, and so certain professors do work here over things like phytate and um, phosphorus. And so it's a lot of the same procedure, I don't know if it makes a difference, but it's actually done on the right side here. Um, and that it's a horizontal incision about three inches before the end of the small intestine. And then it just looks like a T-shaped PVC pipe. And then That's in the L mason, right? I'm sorry? That's in the L mason, though. For well, pigs. No, this no, would be pigs. in pigs. This would yes. be small intestine. So this is the end of the small intestine. Yeah. Yes. And so then, we, have, we have some heifers, yeah. or we have some cows at the farm that also. Yeah. 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 But I'm just saying you can do this other places of the digestive. Oh, yeah. Dr. Kinkle's work 